um, I wrote a book called Socialism is Great. I promise this is not a dry book about politics, but a very human and readable book uh, account about my life working at a, a, a missile factory. In fact, the title um, comes from my publisher. Um, it's a, a famous revolutionary song we used to, to sing um, at the factory. Um, I would have been very happy to burst into singing for you if it is not so uh, harsh to the ear. Um, originally, I called my book Frogging a Well, Jing Di Zhuwa, um, which is a famous story by our ancient philosopher Zhuang Zi about a frog being trapped in the bottom of the well, cannot see the great world beyond a patch of sky above the well. So, of course, the well is a, a metaphor. It's a, it's a boundary, it's a cage, a prison. So this book is a very much a journey uh, uh, about uh, getting out of the well. Um, when I tell people that I recently published a memoir, people often look at me up and down and said, but how old are you? I would often joke, if you don't plan to marry me, why would you care how old I am? <laughs> I think true, traditionally, people write a memoir and when they reach the old age and looking back the past they have taken. Um, but I think a modern memoir has changed. Uh, anybody has an um, interesting or compelling story to tell <clears throat> can write a, a, a memoir. I just hope my own story, a story about chasing your dream, pushing the boundary, um, is compelling enough to justify me to, sit, to stand in front of you today. Um, I was born and raised in Nanjing on the banks of Yangtze River in the eastern part of China. I grew up in a factory's residential compound. Um, probably becoming a factory worker was a likely fate to myself. But um, I had a grand plan for myself. I wanted to go to university. I wanted to become a writer or journalist. But uh, when I was 16, my mother just dragged me out of school. Um, that was 1980, just a few years after the nightmare of the Cultural Revolution. So I was 16. You clever people can quickly work out how old I am exactly. So, um, the decision for taking, out, taking me out of school was uh, purely economical. Um, our family was uh, very poor. And uh, to, when, as I was growing up, to save the craving for meat, my brother and I used to catch cicadas in the summer and uh, roast them over a small bonfire and munch them up. Um, so for those who haven't um, tried, I challenge you, dare, dare you to try. Anyway, so our family was very poor, and I, my mother, I think being uneducated, I, I don't think she ever saw the value of uh, education, and she thought the best thing a mother could do was to secure a job uh, for her daughter, especially a job uh, with a very prestigious state-owned uh, missile factory. Among other products, my factory uh, produced intercontinental missiles that are capable of reaching North America. I have to confess, <laughs> I have to confess I was no nuclear scientist. Um, I have no, no nuclear brain, so anyway, <laughs> I don't have any talk secret to, to, to reveal, but I hope the off book of something, something else. Um, so. Um, when I tell my Western friends that uh, I uh, worked at a rocket factory for 10 years, people often go, wow, that must be so fascinating. And for myself, I could only describe my experience as a uh, mind-numbing, so destroying experience. Um, I was, um, the job I was assigned to was to test a pressure gauge. Was of, I don't know if you know the pressure gauge. It was something fitted on the pipeline to indicate the pressure status. Um, it, it, the job itself was very simple and uh, repetitive. Um, and also today, Chinese people now actually enjoy a lot more personal freedom if there's no democracy. But back then, working for a military factory, you just cannot believe the amount of control we were, we were subject to. Um, you know, no lipsticks. No high heel shoes, certainly no fish net, <laughs> fish net tights. And within um, um, first year, three, the first three years of entering the factory, no dating was allowed. Um, so nothing was personal, even once period. Every month, all women had to go to this uh, hygiene room to show, virtually show blood, the so-called period, please, to prove we were not pregnant. 
That was all done in the name of taking care of women workers' social welfare, but effectively part of the strict family planning policy. I'm just giving ideas on how, um, you know, how kind of control we had. You know, my, my factory was very much a, a, a mini communist state, you know, housing worker in identical block buildings. The flat we had was designated by the factory, you know, feeding us... Um, in dining halls and indoctrinating us at meetings. So my entire life was conf confined you know, within the high security wall of my factory. That's, that was why I originally I called my book A Frog in a Well, Jing Di Zhiwa, because for 10 years I felt very strongly I was a, a frog being trapped in the factory well. Um, so I, just, I, I knew I just had to do something, so I decided to teach myself English um, in the hopes of getting a job uh, with one of the foreign companies um, as an interpreter in the foreign companies in the 80s who was starting slowly setting up shops in Nanjing. Of course, now looking back, you know, learning English effectively changed my life because it broadened my horizon and opened my mind. Um, so um, in those days, it was actually quite difficult for a non-student to, to learn English. Unlike today, there are so many English courses on offer, and the pirate DVD of the latest Hollywood movies are readily for sale at every street corner. And um, you know, back then, I had to, to begin with, I had to borrow a uh, radio from my cousin, uh, because our family was so poor, we didn't even own a uh, radio. I followed an uh, English teaching program called New Concept English, and I find it just really English. New Concept indeed. Um, I become rather fascinated by this language system, so different from our characters. Sometimes to find uh, uh, a little bit of quiet time to study, uh, while I was still working at the factory, I would go to a rubbish dump um, to, 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 f to make use of the time to, to learn a little bit of language. Um, so it, I, in fact, I was obsessed. Sometimes I would find myself um, talking, talking to myself uh, in English, or sometimes I would bicycling, riding my pigeon bicycle in the dark street of Nanjing, singing English songs. Because I was told that um, singing English is a very good way to learn the language. I would cycle in the street and sing, sing, sing a song. <laughs> you might think that carpenters was a bit naff, but uh, for us, the carpenters represented the high culture from the West. Because the carpenters was one of the first Western bands that uh, went on sale. Um, so, and, you know, of course, I mean, then, when I began to... When I began to teach myself English, some of my colleagues um, laughed at me as a toad who dreams to eat swan's meat. That's a, a, a Chinese saying, uh, meaning I was uh, dreaming for something impossible. They said, you are a factory worker. Why would you want to learn English? You would never be able to master language anyway, they told me openly. I think anywhere in the world, people don't like other people who think or behave differently. And in our Chinese culture, there are just so many sayings. The traditional wisdom always urges people not to be different. Um, for example, the birds who flies out first gets shot first. <laughs> the big trees, the big trees catches wind. There are so many things to tell you not to be different. Um, but slowly, I, I just didn't, I didn't mind what other people thought about me as the concept of individualism took roots in me. Um, I have to say, in that transformation, Jane Eyre played an important role. Charlotte Bronte's um, masterpiece was one of the first uh, books I ever read in English, a simplified version of English novel. It just struck a chord. I guess I just identified with Jane Eyre, who, unlike many leading characters from classic novels, she's not beautiful or charming. I was always regarded as ugly. Um, I guess I have dark skins. Um, you know, Chinese people don't like dark skin. My father, when I was young, my father used to tell me um, I was not their natural daughter. Uh, they picked me, they picked me up from the coal dump, the place you dump the coal. That's why my skin was so dark. I guess that reflected his disappointment in me. Um, so I just being ugly, and I just identified with this character Jane, and uh, I just totally understand her wish 
to see and interact with the bigger world. And of course, she's a rebel. If she conforms the social convention of Victorian England, she would never have found happiness. Um, so she generally become my inspiring model. So here you see the, the transforming power of the literature. Heroes like Jane Eyre slowly uh, bring down the walls around, around me. So um, looking back now, you know, what I learned from English was not just the ABCs, but the whole culture package. Slowly, I dared to be different. I began to wear short skirt. I was not really encouraged. I'm still wearing short skirts today. <laughs> um, I had boyfriends, and after my English improved, uh, I began to listen to uh, VOA and BBC, which broadcast news very different from our propaganda. And I formed a literary group, and with our friends, we were talking about the politics all the time. It's answer to China. And um, in 1989, just a few days before June 4th, before the terrible crackdown, I organized the biggest demonstration among factory workers um, still in Nanjing and support the democratic movement led by the students in Tiananmen. Um, um, I was very sad to, to see what happened, but I was very proud of the act of uh, defiance because I felt very strongly that individuals can, individuals act can make a uh, difference. Of course, by the time I organized the demonstration mentally, I was already out of my factory well. And phys physically, I jumped out of the factory well in the end of 1990 when I went to England. Once over there, a childhood dream became alive again. I decided to uh, pursue my dream of, of becoming a journalist. So uh, I took a course in journalism. Three years later, after I returned to China, I started my career working for Western journalists as a fixer, assistant, a kind of an interpreter. And, um, and then I decided to become a freelance, um, become, become a journalist of my own rights. While based in China, I write for the Western media in English. Uh, follow my interest, I, um, I focused on stories of common human interest, um, emotionally, physically displaced migrant workers, um, laid off workers, or kidnapping women, um, prostitute, prostitutes. So um, I didn't choose the easy path for myself. And uh, being a Chinese, I did not have any connection with Western media. And my English was not very good. And in fact, you know, after studying English diligently for more than 20 years, I still make the basic mistakes. I'm sure you have noticed. Um, and also, I didn't exactly know how things work in the Western media. But uh, I also felt that I, I enjoyed the challenge of being a freelance journalist writing for Western media. And I felt I have something different to offer compared to my Western colleague. Um, I, I felt I have the insight to a Chinese culture, and I, I have a good understanding of where China was coming from. So, uh, so far, I, um, I have managed to publish many articles in many top publications um, around, around the world. Um, I guess here again, the point I want to make is when you dare to step up your usual boundary, and uh, not following the beaten path, you often get richly rewarded. And today now I am, I'm based in China, I'm based in Beijing, working as a writer. I'm just finishing my first novel about prostitution. Um, that's a pure work of fiction. I've done a few things in my life, but not prostitute yet. Um, <laughs> Um, I also, was, um, also work as a journalist, I'm a television talk show host and social commentator and frequently being interviewed by international media. So in many ways, I, I'm really living my, my dream life. I feel every day I tell myself how lucky I am. Um, of course, I, I think I was lucky. I was born in the right time. China had opened it up. And if I have anything to share, that is, um, do not be a frog in a well. Um, I think um, for all of us, uh, at some stage in our life, uh, we would uh, encounter wells in different forms. For example, when I wanted to learn English, some of my colleagues laughed at me as a toad who dreams to eat swan's meat, um, laughing at my effort of learning English. They tried to, try, they tried to place me in a well and tell me things I, cannot, I couldn't do. And I do not ever listen to people like them. 
um, you know, um, do not place yourself in a well. You can just about do anything you want. You can be, you can be anything you want if you follow your dream, follow your passions. Yes, uh, a, a, a factory girl can learn English and master language and write the books in that language. Yes, uh, a former factory girl can get articles published in New York Times. And yes, a former factory girl can be on the same, on the same footing as an ambassador. Um, just last Sunday, I had an on-stage conversation with Australian ambassador um, talking about um, where China, how far has China come. And of course, sometimes you do not want to be, do not, do not want to place yourself in a well, but you find yourself being pushed into a well. Then I would say that uh, find your inspiration, uh, find your passion. If you follow them, they, they will give you the drive, the strength, and, uh, and the confidence to jump out of the well. Um, after all these years, I still have not managed to eat swan's meat. I have tried many, many things. I, I have competition, I bet I will win. I tried all sorts of weird things but not swan's meat, but uh, nobody calls me a, a toad or a frog anymore. I have lung out of my well into this great world and I just love it. Thank you. Thank you.